All right. Hello. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking you for your patience with me. Um, it's been sort of a weird, hard semester, uh, and I have fallen quite behind. Um, so thank you for being patient. Uh, your grades are popping up. I should be through them uh, today or tomorrow. Um, in the way of an apology, but I've decided if I'm behind, uh, there's no sense to keeping the fire on you. So um, what I'm doing is I'm amending the, the date, the due date for the second test for this course to March 29th. Um, at March 29th at 11.55 p.m. Uh, and uh, that'll give you an extra week with the, this material um, and the feedback from the last test and all of that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that, that helps you out a little bit. Um, uh, this test, uh, so this video is um, regarding the second test. Uh, this test is exactly the same as uh, the other. It's out of 20, um, four questions, five points each. Um, all of the same policies uh, it, it hold for this one, the mystic uh, assignment policy. Uh, many of you know from experience that um, I'm very forthcoming with uh, extensions, but you've got to work with me in order for me to work with you. Um, I didn't have any problems with assignment submission the last time, so um, it's you're good on that, but make sure I get it. And uh, please, 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 uh, with a bit of a thread attached, um, it, do not plagiarize material. If you're using something external to the course, um, paraphrasing or even taking word for word, uh, throw a reference on there. Um, it's all there for you to use. Uh, you just have to tell people you are using it rather than claiming credit for somebody else's work yourself. Uh, this is pretty well the academic cardinal sin plagiarism, so um, I, I am a tough cop on it. Uh, so the readings, uh, you have um, Immanuel Kant's Grounding to the Metaphysic of Morals, um, it, which you're probably cursing at this point. It's probably the most difficult thing uh, that we're reading in this class. On the upside, uh, we have two texts by John Stuart Mill, Utilitarianism and On Liberty, which is probably the easiest of the material that, um, that we'll engage with all semester. So, um, it, well, it's lopsided, at least this particular test is um, balanced. Uh, you have all of the video material that you're responsible for, um, and uh, these are short an answer questions requiring a minimum of two paragraphs of writing for your response. A paragraph is a bare minimum of three sentences, but your, uh, your responses should be substantial and exceed this minimum. Basically, what I'm asking you for is like four mini essays. So um, it, I need them to be full sentences, point form, responses are too vague uh, to be acceptable. And what you are trying to do here is write something that explains the theory in a way that your reader, in this case me, but anybody should be able to pick it up in this manner, can figure out what is going on. Right? So clear, concise, able to communicate about complicated ideas in written form um, it, accurately, right? Uh, that's, that's what I'm looking for um, uh, for these tests. Uh, so we've got four questions, two on Kant, uh, one on Mills on Liberty, and then on this particular test I'm going to have you um, formulate an argument for me because you should be at this point formulating arguments. Like I say, five points each total out of 20. Uh, the first one has to do with the first formulation of the categorical imperative, um, which I quote for you, act only according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Um, in his discussion of this imperative, Kant draws a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. I went over this with you. Um, uh, what I want you to do is introduce the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties, illustrating the distinction using examples. So, now, with regard to this, uh, we know that imperfect duties have a weaker sense of moral obligation and perfect duties have a stronger sense of moral obligation. What I want to see 
is how to make the distinction when you go to apply the formulation of the categorical imperative. If that makes any sense. Right. Um, and I really want to see that you know what you're talking about in terms of, of formulating examples. Um, I shall also allow you to use Kant's examples or my examples um, with regard to illustrating this. That's fine, just as long as you can explain how the example exemplifies what you're trying to describe. So uh, that is your task there. Right, um, and uh, your, your quick guide is perfect duties stem from reason, imperfect duties from the will. But you'll have to explain what you, what I, what we mean by that. Right. So that's the first question there. Um, so introduce the first formulation, introduce the distinction, illustrate with examples. Bing, bang, boom. Right. Um, question number two and Kant. Kant introduces the humanity principle. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of another, always as an end in itself and never merely as a means, as another formulation of the categorical imperative. This principle, Kant argues, rests on the dignity of human beings. He argues that human beings are objects of respect. Why are human beings according to, so this is what you do, right? Why are human beings, according to Kant, objects of respect? And how does this position flow naturally, as Kant argues that it does, from the first formulation of the categorical imperative? Now, a um, bit of a roadmap for this one. Uh, this is how we get from the first formulation to the second formulation of the categorical imperative. And the term in the middle is autonomy. Kant's as Sandel calls it, rather demanding uh, notion of freedom. Right? Um, it, it, when we apply the first formulation, we show that we're autonomous. What does that mean? How does it do that? Well, how do we get to the idea that human beings, more generally rational beings, that have this effective form of reason that can act on the will, right, are valuable? How do, how do we get from there to there? All right, so um, that's what I am asking you to engage with. Um, it's, it's one of the major moves in Kant's philosophy, and we, we, we need, if we're going to claim to understand what the heck Kant is talking about, the grounding, to engage with that. So um, how does Kant get from the first formulation to the second formulation? I've driven, uh, drawn you a little roadmap here, um, uh, the line about objects of respect that's got a page reference to it. And why are human beings objects of respect? Because we're autonomous. What does that mean? Um, how does this position flow naturally, as Kant argues it does, from the first formulation of the categorical imperative? That should be fairly straightforward, as straightforward as Kant can be. Um, question number three, this is your one on Mill. Uh, Mill introduces the notion of political liberty and his own liberty to address a specific criticism of the principle of utility related to individual human rights, which was introduced by Michael Sandel in that Justice episode two, um, which is posted to Moodle, uh, putting a price tag on life. Um, yeah, Sandel and one of his students introduce um, the notion that liberty does not sufficiently take into account uh, the rights of individuals or minorities. Well, that's why we have liberty, according to Mill. Right? Introduce the notion of political liberty advanced by Mill and discuss how this notion might respond to the criticism presented by Sandel. Right? Uh, so, um, the notion of political liberty, well, you, you're going to find it in your own liberty kind of thing. He's talking about a civic or social liberty and not some sort of, like Kant would talk about, um, intrinsic value that, that, that bestows a dignity on the individuals. Right? So this is civic and social liberty, and it is, I think it's, if memory serves, like page five, he, um, page five, uh, ba -doo -boo -boo. Um, yeah, I thought it was page five. Just give me a second here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Page 
One, he introduces um, a, a civic or social liberty, the nature and limits of the power which can le le be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. Right? Uh, he continues at the top of page five, there is a limit to the legitimate inter interference of the collective opinion with the individual ind independence, and to find that limit and maintain it against encroachment um, is as in in indispensable to a good condition of human fair affairs as is protection against political despotism. So the question is where to um, place the limit, right? Uh, which he tells you is the principle of harm. So it's a question of the principle of harm. Um, so two things I want there, all right? One, introduce liberty generally as Mill does, all right? And then show how that responds to the criticism of, um, of, 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 of utilitarianism or utility introduced in the Sand Elvidium. It's the, I think the second of um, the two um, criticisms. The first was it's it not appropriate to aggregate all the value to a single standard, right? um, which Mill handles in his utilitarianism. So I'm not talking about that value to a single standard one. I'm talking about the individual rights one. Right? And finally, Rick Roderick in his video Kant and the Path uh, to Enlightenment makes the following claim regarding both Kantian and utilitarian morality. Now, um, I should note here, uh, I quoted from the Kant video, but he makes the same argument in the Mill on Liberty video. Right? <clears throat> he says, in fact, these two moral theories, in terms of just pure moral theory, still dominate the standard philosophical discussion. Now, it's clear to me that one of them is more interesting than the other. I think you know which one is more interesting to me. The crowd laughs. Right? But I've got to warn you that there are knockdown objections to both. And by knockdown objections, I mean knockdown objections. We know that these theories are wrong because there are knockdown objections to them. The best way to look at both of them, however, might be as models for moral action. If by models, uh, if by models, um, we don't mean like the shopping mart idea of something that we do once in a while, but as a way to think about a moral life, if you're interested in it. So, what does Rick Roderick mean by calling these theories models of moral action. And I'll give you a little bit on that right now. Um, what Roderick is arguing here is that neither Kantian or utilitarian morality are practical or applicable moral theories. There shouldn't be utilitarians out there. There shouldn't be Kantians out there. Rather, what we get from theories like this and theories like this and theories like this are tools for thinking about what makes a right choice or a right action right, what makes a wrong choice or a wrong action wrong. So for Kant, for example, this has to be one of the most systematic ways of thinking about uh, the moral nature of a principle and what effect the intentions that stand behind an action have on the moral quality of that action, right? That's what Kant is good at. This is a systematic analysis of precisely that. What we get from John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham as well is a way to think about what effects the consequences of an action have with regard to the, 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 the immorality or the morality of said action. Right. So these are tools for helping us think about how to live a moral life rather than formulas that we can just apply and live a moral life by those formulas. So these are rule books. Right. These are tools to help you think about what it takes to live a moral life. Now, Roderick argues that there are knockdown objections. I mean, the, one of the classic ones for Kant is, well, we know we have a categorical duty not to lie. 
what if an armed assailant comes into the class and asks where one of you are? Well, do I have a categorical duty not to lie? So I tell them, you're right there. And the outcome is predictable, right? Now, we've already seen in utilitarianism um, a critique of this moral theory, right? Uh, think back to your Aristotle in that sneaky Pete case, right? Pete was going to mug the old lady, but for some reason didn't get around to it. Instead, he helped her to her door with her groceries because a police officer was going to be there and arrest him, right? Now, just by a consequential account, a consequentialist analysis of his action, Pete did a good thing but he was going to mug the lady. Right? There are problems with thinking about morality that way. Right? So, and just more generally, right, look at what Mill had to do in On Liberty to build a structure basically to protect the individual from the effects of unbridled utility. Right? We've got to build all of these political and social structures just so that people, being utilitarians, don't abuse one another. There might be something wrong with your moral theory. But nonetheless, we, we do think that consequences matter when evaluating the, 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 the morality of a particular action, right? So that's what Roderick is arguing. These are tools for thinking about morality. So what do I want you to do? Tell me, what does Rock mean, uh, Roderick mean by calling these theories models of moral action? Or for moral action? Of? Yeah, I think so. Anyhow, what does he mean by that? Right. That's step one. And step two, it would seem that either Roderick is right or, is, or he's wrong. In either case, this would get, come down to an argument. This is your task. You are to make an argument. Supporting your position with an argument, one that makes use of your understanding of the material study and, and study in this course. Right? So this isn't just a reflection. Right? This is, you use your knowledge of Kant and Mill in order to respond to Roderick. Right? How would you respond to this assessment of Kantian and utilitarian morality? And I should point out there are a few ways to answer this. You might want to say right on. Right on, Roderick is quite right. So, what you would do in order to agree with Roderick is provide a brief summary of the Kantian and utilitarian positions and show how Roderick is right that these are theoretical models and not practically applicable. Right? If you want to argue that Roderick is wrong, and he might be, right? That means that either Kantian or utilitarian morality are practically applicable moral theories and not mere models of moral action. So, pick one. Which one? Right? Should we be Kantians? Should we be utilitarians? Right? Is there a compelling case that you can... Well, Roderick might be right about Kant over there, but Mill Right? between his utilitarianism and on liberty, for example, has defended himself against all possible criticisms. Right? Or, Roderick is being ungenerous to Kant. He might be correct about utility. Right? But Kantian morality actually has a lot to offer in the way of a practical moral system, not just as a model. Right? So, um, those are the options. Those are the options. Um, at this point, you should be making an argument. And of course, I assess all of your responses on the basis of the clarity of the response, the completeness. Did I tell you to do something and then you didn't do it? Or have you done everything? Um, understanding exhibited in your use of the course material, like do you get it? Right? And the strength of the argument or insight into the material in question. Right? So, um, question four, you've got an argument. I'll be applying fairly standard argument evaluation techniques um, to, to evaluate the strength of your argument. 
right? Um, and at the same time, making sure you understand what's going on with camp, that you've presented your material in a clear and concise kind of way, that your examples exemplify what you're trying to exemplify, etc. Right? Um, now, with the expanded uh, deadline, uh, which is March 29th again at 11.55 p.m., five minutes to midnight, um, uh, you should have lots of time to break these questions down, work on them, and oh, please, 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 please proofread. Proofread. Um, the, on the last test, I found there were a lot of clarity issues that a good proofread would have handled. It would have handled. Just read it over. Read it out loud, right? Um, just to make sure it makes any sort of sense. If you've got a buddy, have your buddy read it over for you. I mean, they're not wildly long. Right? So, I mean, your buddy's got 20 minutes to say, well, does this make sense? This makes sense. Right? So, um, again, thank you for your patience. Um, hopefully the extra time does you a bit of good. And um, I look forward to reading your responses, and we'll grade them quickly this time. Okay, um, have good days, one for each of you.